feel like I should start with an elderly and cracking voice, because when they uh, advertised this on Twitter, somebody decided they were going to brand me as a, as a PowerShell veteran, and I'm not quite sure what a veteran is, but I've been doing this for long enough that people feel that they can, they can put that tag on. So I, I did contemplate coming up here with a walking stick and a, and a white wig and what have you. This uh, session is titled, What Makes a Good Shared PowerShell Module? And it's basically about writing modules that you share with other people, writing code to share with other people that you place in modules. Uh, I'm James O'Neill, as it kind of hinted at on the previous slide. There are my uh, contact details. If you're live tweeting any of this, I'm at James O'Neill. Uh, you can find me on Git. For some reason, when I set up my Git account, it became JH O'Neill. And uh, there's my email address and the address of my blog. There's a couple of references to the blog in there. I will tweet the link to this slide deck afterwards. It will probably end up somewhere on Git. Um, my background is I, I, uh, I like to say I served 10 years at Microsoft because it makes it sound like it was a jail sentence. Uh, and they, they released me in 2010, so I've been out in the world for, for, for nearly 10 years. Um, worked for some interesting people. I spent uh, about two years working for uh, the Mercedes F1 team, which was, which was great fun and, and very stressful. And uh, now I, uh, I like to say that I'm a mercenary, although people seem to prefer the word freelance. Um, I'm between, con between uh, engagements at the moment, so if I don't manage to put any of you off and you uh, are looking for some PowerShell skills, well, there are the contact details. Now, just after I left Microsoft, the first big international uh, PowerShell gig was run in Las Vegas. And this has kind of morphed into the PowerShell Summit that they run in, in Redmond every year. And one of the luminaries from the, the PowerShell world, a guy called Jeff Hicks, uh, got us all together and said, um, we really ought to turn some of this content into a book. And it became, this book became the, the PowerShell Deep Dives. Um, it's still selling. It's, um, it, Jeff actually had this really bright idea. He said, look, we're never going to figure out how to divide the royalties between us, so should we just give them to charity? And he picked the Save the Children Fund, and everybody said, yeah, oh, Save the Children's great. So all the proceeds from this go to Save the Children. And we all got asked to turn things that we produced for the, this conference into chapters for the Deep Dives book. Now, at that point, I had written the first PowerShell support for Hyper-V. If those of you who, who go back to Hyper-V in Server 2008 remember, uh, it didn't have its own um, PowerShell module. Um, I put a few PowerShell functions together for it, and one of my colleagues um, in a session a bit like this that we did in a cinema down in London said, oh yes, James is going to release this through CodePlex. And I went, I'm what? Okay, so this thing got, got onto CodePlex, and it got developed, and it got developed. By the time I left Microsoft, it had had about 120, 130,000 downloads, something like that. And it was still being downloaded up to the point where, where CodePlex um, ceased to exist. So I had, at that point, one of the most downloaded modules ever, one of the most successful modules ever. And I got asked to run a session on what makes a successful module, and that ended up in the book. And I started thinking a little while ago, it was time to come back and revisit the advice that I put in that, that, that piece of the book. So that advice basically is, is summarized here. Right? One of the things, and, and talking to Richard Sidaway, who some of you will know beforehand, he said, you have to get the word composable into this slide. Well, one of the founding principles of PowerShell is it's composable pieces that you put together. Right? So if you're writing functions that you put into a module, one of the things is you make them reusable, you make it possible to compose other things with your functions, or use other things kind of composed into your functions, if you like. That meant that you, one of the things that I saw people failing to do over and over again was to write with the pipeline in mind. People were using the wrong write commands, and the wrong out commands. You also see people who pick really bizarre names for stuff. Setting command names actually gives you 
a really good basis for what the spec is of what you're doing. You know, we don't have PowerShell functions generally called do stuff, right? But if you look in Windows, if you look at, I always use ipconfig as an example. ipconfig has sprouted so many extra bits over the years that all the logic of what you're doing in ipconfig isn't in the name of the command, it's in the command line switches, right? So don't put the meaning in the switches, put it in the function name. And be smart about parameters. That was one of the other ones. The other ones, uh, yeah, use what if or get really good with backups. Um, smart handling of errors. Um, again, back when, when this was done, a lot of what I said was, uh, or a lot of what I saw was, uh, was around error handling. And the other thing was um, providing good help. Um, does that advice still stand up? Um, whoops. I've just gone the wrong way. Let's try that again. Does that advice still stand up? Well, actually, mostly it does. That's the rather satisfying thing. Um, one of the themes that you'll get me talking about here is how satisfying it is when you've written something and then you go back to it having almost entirely forgotten what you did, and you go, crumbs, I was smart when I wrote that, wasn't I? And you get the reverse. You know, we've, we've all probably had that. We've all also probably had the one where you go back and you go, what idiot wrote this? And then you go, oh, yes, it was me, wasn't it? But what, what was I trying to achieve? What's, what is this standard for a good shared, shareable module? And I like to, to break this down as kind of four re's. So it's reliable. It works, it doesn't crash, but it does what we expect it to do, at least within certain constraints, right? The, we might have unrealistic expectations, the author might, might not have had good expectations, might not have foreseen what we were going to do. And does it actually do what it says on the tin? A lot of the time, if I have one thing that I want to say to people who write actually quite good PowerShell, it's, for pity's sake, explain what the thing does. Somebody says, oh, I've got something that, I'll try and pick a random example, works with Microsoft Visio. Great, okay. And you've got one command in it called make Visio that takes 100 command line switches. There is, I'm not thinking of a real one, by the way. I'm, I've, I'm sort of synthesizing multiple ones together here. Um, and now you don't tell me how it works. You don't show me any examples. And it's almost useless. You've done something really clever. And then at the last hurdle, you haven't actually explained what you've done, and so you haven't made it usable. So that's point one. The next one is reusability. Um, there's a lot of... Let me just do a quick sidetrack for a second. Um, I'm just thinking, how big a tangent can I go off at? I'm not going to go off at too big a tangent. Um, in Oxford, which is the nearest big place to where I live, there's a plaque on the wall as you walk down the high street saying, just here was the laboratory of Robert Hooke. And Robert Hooke almost gets like a footnote in... Um, in history, because uh, he was sort of pushed into, into obscurity by Isaac Newton. Um, and there's a letter that Newton wrote to Hooke, kind of apologising for this. And it's immortalised, if you ever look around the edge of a two-pound coin, there's a phrase, standing on the shoulders of giants. And Newton wrote to Hooke, if I've seen further than other men, it's been because I have been standing on the shoulders of giants, or something like that. And a lot of what we do in PowerShell, we are actually basically standing on the shoulders of the people who've come before. We take other people's stuff and we go, oh yeah, we don't need that bit, we don't need that bit, we don't need that. just get rid of those and take this really interesting bit and then I can recycle that into something I'm doing. So the author wrote this code and they made it possible for me to take a piece of it and use it in a way that they never imagined or they... Um, 
the, 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 that I've come up with. And I call that sort of recyclability. Okay? So not only has the author said, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of write this so that you know, my expectations aren't completely blinkered, which is the reusable bit, but I can also recycle this code. Anybody here only release perfect code? I wish. So we need to be able to fix it. Um, so when I leave the top off the, this thing and go and look inside, I need to be able to figure out what's going on. And again, sometimes um, you take your car to the garage and the mechanic looks under the bonnet and goes, I haven't seen one of these before. All crumbs. Um, where have they hidden the whatever it is that they're trying to fix? So we've got to try and make it easy. So how do we do these things? So let's start off with the, the thing about doing what it says. And like I, I said previously, that kind of set out your stall when you let something out into the wild is really quite important. Um, we let our stuff out in the world, and the problem is your module is going to be run in ways that you had no way of foreseeing. It's going to be run by people you don't know in ways that you don't understand on systems you can't access. That's, that's the kind of three-part list there. So you've got no control over this as soon as you've released it. Um, I saw this article when I was, when I was revising the slides. Um, and this was somebody talking about going and finding where you have already used one of your own modules. Well, that's great, but that, that scope is so restricted that actually you have to basically say, I can't ever break anything. Once you've created an API, you're kind of stuck with it for, forever. So you have to not introduce breaking changes but you also need to be clear what the thing does and doesn't do. So we start off with, say what it does. The name ought to be a clue. Now, I said the, the, the original PowerShell conference that gave rise to the Deep Dives book was years ago, and I've been collecting examples of some of this stuff as I go along that this is not just something that came completely out of the blue. I kind of get, yeah, I'll keep that one, and I'll keep that one. So I screenshotted this from a client a couple of years ago. I had a script called enable users, and it's got a function called enable audio video, and its main purpose is to disable audio video. I mean, what, what do you say to a person who writes a function whose job is to turn something off, and they call it turn on. All right? Make the name a clue. It also is really helpful, though, when you start finding that the scope of what you do begins to creep. Right? We all meet scope creep in different places. And if you start thinking, well, yeah, and, and somebody wants to enable something else, this is all to do with... Um, this was on-premise Skype for business users. On-premises, I should say. I watched somebody getting very irate about premise versus premises. This was on-premises Skype for business. Um, if somebody says, we want to kind of enable another feature, well, at least this one is uh, t t setting its scope, and it's not allowing the scope to creep. The other thing is, at least when you start, use comment-based help. As you get more sophisticated, it might be better to spin the help off to separate files. And I'm not saying comment-based help is right, external help is wrong, but as a starting point, put in comment-based help and at least put in a synopsis and an example. Now, the synopsis just says what was in that description. The only thing is, the person that wrote that had the description kind of loose on its own you couldn't run enable audio video minus help and find out what the thing was. And have an example that shows how the thing is used. The more examples you've got, the more use cases you've got, the better. And I'll talk a bit more about this as we go on because examples have a really important role in the world. 
Now, writing help, I have to say, isn't easy. It gets easier with practice. But you do get people who write what I call fettle widgets help. And this comes back to, to applications we used to see years ago. Um, you can see here, classic 19, uh, 1990s app, and it's got a button on it that says fettle widgets. And you go, well, what on earth does that do? So you click the help, and it says, press this button if you want widgets to be fettled. Yeah, I could work that out from the verb noun construct on the button, right? I can, what it doesn't tell me is what a widget is, or what fettling does, or why I'd want to do the one thing to the other thing, right? This is not helpful. So when I see something like that in a script, it goes in my library of kind of offenders. I can kind of work out that a switch parameter called balance user has the job of balancing users. What does balancing mean? What's an unbalanced user, for heaven's sake? Well, yeah, we've all met an unbalanced user at some point in our lives. Um, but what on earth does that do? You don't have to write war and peace. Something the length of a tweet, in fact, these days, with a, with a tweet being more than 140 characters, a tweet is probably ample. Right? You don't need a lot of help. But here, if specified, distributes users among servers. That's helpful. Balance user, who knows? Now, um, help is much underrated. If you write the synopsis at the beginning, almost as the first thing you do after writing the function name, and you write examples of how it works, and you label the parameters, that is going to be a benefit. But those examples are like a contract with the user for what the function actually does. It also keeps your mind on the task in hand. Right? When I talked about not being able to use other people's code, the reason is they didn't explain what it did, they didn't explain what the parameters are for, um, and so on. And people go, but you've got the code. If I have to look at your code to figure out how your function works and what it does, I am going to hate you by the end of it. Okay, don't make me go there. i would make that point on another slide, by the way, but um, yeah, I'll skip that when I get there. But that information is crucial to, can I make use of this thing that you've given me? The thing is, it's nice that we've got investment consultants here, because I can say, you know, it's an investment. You have to put a little in the jar every day. Okay? You are not going to come back and do it at the end. Right? We all tell ourselves, we'll write the documentation at the end. Right? By your second or third project, you know that this is a lie. It's a lie that you tell management, it's a lie you tell customers, it's a lie you tell yourself. Okay? You are not going to do it at the end. Right? Just like, as the finance people will say, you're not going to get to my age and go, oh yeah, pension, better do something about that now. You know, put a penny in the jar every day. Um, the other thing is, the first, the first minute that any pressure gets on our time, what do we do? Oh, well, if we can show code that's doing something, that's, that's, you know, that's a tick in the box. We can say to management, hey, I've written something and it's doing this. And code is actually more fun than writing documentation, right? So as soon as there's pressure on time, what's the first thing we do? We say, oh, we'll, we'll, do it. we'll just leave the documentation for now. Right? And so it pile, goes into that big pile we call technical debt. Second thing that goes is testing. Okay? And this is why I keep coming back to the importance of examples. I have this thing about help equals test equals spec, and we'll, we'll see more of that in a minute. When you put examples into your help, sometimes when you write the example, you go, hang on, this is silly. I'm making people do something. Now I actually write this down as an example. I'm making somebody use this thing in a way that's, that's not good. So sometimes it actually says, yeah, we need to make these changes. 
It's also the start of a test script, and that's coming up. And sometimes it's just a useful aid memoir for you. Okay? I, um, I do a lot of photography. You'll see, those of you who are, who are into photography, you'll see when I, when I switch away from PowerPoint, uh, you'll see there's an Adobe Lightroom icon on the bottom. And I wrote some PowerShell stuff to go and dig in the photos database for, for Lightroom and make changes. So one of the first things I did was I said, yeah, and I keep running this same kind of command, go here and rename these items in the Lightroom database and on disk. And I can never remember how it works. So what shall I do? I'll take an example of where I ran it. One sentence of explanation, paste it into the help as an example. Now it's there forevermore. But that's also my contract with the user that says, this is how this thing works. Okay? You can take this command and you can say, include these files, replace this bit with this, oh, and run it with a verbose switch, and it will change the file name from image to dive, and whatever. So my diving photos get renamed. Now, I mentioned this thing about help, uh, examples in help at the start of a test script. I like to push this, this kind of idea of help equals spec equals test. When you look at um, the synopsis in the help for a command, it tells you what it does. And the, the parameter descriptions tell you um, how it does it, and the examples explain that how a little bit better. One of the things that you want to do is check that the examples still work, okay? Because there's nothing more frustrating than somebody giving you an example and you go, right, okay, I'll copy and paste that example, paste, click, the example doesn't run, okay? So one of your first things in your pester tests are, do my help examples actually work, okay? Now, it should be that something that you want to test is probably something important enough to make an example out of. So this works both ways. And if you've done anything with Pester, can I quick show of hands who's, who's used Pester in any way? Right, so that's probably the majority. Um, if you've written a Pester test, when you collapse a Pester test, the outline looks like a functional spec. And we can see this on, on this slide. So here is a, this is again a photography one. I wrote some stuff to use the um, HTTP API that my camera implements. Because, you know, why, you know, you, you do photography, you do PowerShell, why wouldn't you go and do it? Oh, some of the projects I take on. So here's a spec of what it can do. And this is just my pester test rolled up. So you can see one of the things it can do, it, it can set multiple camera settings. Well, okay, how does it do that? So here's my example that says set these settings on the camera. And that, the help is basically telling the user, look, I'm committing to do these things. It's my, like I, I keep calling it a contract. I'm going to do these things that are part of the spec. And let's prove that it does it. So when I expand that piece of PESTA, you can see there's the actual process. So I'm running the command that's up there, and I'm checking that it works. So. I basically made my help and my spec and my test all the same thing, okay? Really useful. So this is getting us pretty, pretty well down the track of meeting users' expectations, but it's not really all the way. Um, I have this phrase about make it power shelly. Um, and recently there was a discussion about something and Bruce Payette, who was one of the... Um, original designers for, for PowerShell said, oh, so-and-so isn't really very powershell -y. Um So making it powershell means giving users similar experiences to what they, they see elsewhere. Now, we didn't always write programs that were powershell -y. And I hesitate to put this up, um, but I was working with somebody recently and I kept seeing things like read host in his code. 
and then there'd be lots of bright hosts, and, and he produced nice coloured output, and, and, and this was all kind of like the programs I wrote when I was first writing programs in BASIC on a, on a Sinclair Spectrum, which wasn't my first computer, incidentally. Um, and I just want to go, don't ever write code like that. Don't use read host. Don't think about making your output colored. Don't, just don't, right? If you're going to do it as PowerShell, you should be able to run it without any user interaction. So those should be parameters. If the user doesn't provide the parameters, then say, well, look, they're mandatory parameters, and there's a help message that tells you what you're supposed to put in, right? We don't really need to know the cross-sectional area. This is just working out the, the volume of the cylinder. We don't really need to know it, but we could run it with verbose to see it and then just return it as, as the value. Don't, don't be doing stuff with right host. Don't do stuff with colors. Sorry. Personal bugbear. So what do users actually expect? Standard command. Command names, standard parameter names, okay? So, you see force in quite a lot of places. Force is kind of a standard. We don't say subdirectories, we say recurse. We use property for a lot of things. We, and so there are standard names we use for parameters. If you see those names somewhere else, plagiarize them. Use the same thing, okay? Don't as I say, don't worry about colors. You know, If the most important question you're asking when you write your code is what color is the output, okay, you have a number of problems that you need to solve, and PowerShell is probably not the one to solve them. But that doesn't mean no um, output. You know, use write progress. Use write verbose. Occasionally, where you need to tell the user something that isn't part of the output, allow yourself to use write host. Okay? It's not forbidden. Okay? Just remember, it's not output. It's decoration to show a person, not output. Okay? Huge number of commands only accept one input. You say, right, okay, I want to copy 10 files. Oh, no, you've got to go copy first file, copy second file, copy third file, and you have to run it in a loop or something like that. No, except multiple inputs. That's one of the, one of the, the early building blocks. A um, lot of people like to use Booleans, and I don't understand why you would use a Boolean. Well, there are a few cases where it makes sense, but usually you can structure things to use a switch. Um, I mentioned what if before. If you don't use what if, get good with um, your restore technology. And the other one that is a favorite of mine is don't expect the user to, to know the inner workings of what you're using. So a classic case is you're going to get multiple things with a wildcard. And what you're calling uses SQL syntax, so it uses percent for the wildcard. Well, how does the user know that? The user's going to put star in, because that's standard everywhere else, right? So whose job is it? to get this right. Is it your job to say, oh, the user put in star, I know that they meant wildcard, so I'll replace star with percent, and I'll do the query properly, or do you go, well, you ought to know that I'm calling SQL underneath. I'm, 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 it's not actually SQL, I'm calling sim or WMI, and it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, the query language for that, but it's based on SQL, so you, sh you well, why? And the other one that's a, that's a pain is um, validation. Now, I've got a long blog post that I wrote this week that's got some stuff, or wrote over about three weeks and posted at the start of this week, um, that's got some stuff in it on validation. But one of the things with validation is, quite often, what we're trying to do is to save ourselves the problem of handling bad input further down the function. Right? That's not the job of validation. The job of validation is to get the user to put the right thing in. And if you think they're the same thing, look at it from a user's point of view. Okay? Here's an example of bad validation. 
So there's a validate pattern option for a parameter. So I put in test C colon, and it comes back, and it says that. Now, who can tell me what I'm supposed to put in? Come on, you're all PowerShell experts. I'm waiting. Bueller? Bueller? Anyone? Hmm? Well done. Have you, you've, but you've been to one of, my, one of these talks before. You might have actually seen this example. Have you seen this again? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's basically saying you've got to put in a UNC path. So it's got to be double backslash some characters, backslash some more characters, and then the end of the string. Right? Not many users are going to understand this. Okay? The person that puts this in their code is not helping their users. Right? They've saved themselves writing something a bit further on in the code that says, if the if input does not match this, then raise an error. But they've just been lazy about it. On the other hand, if you look at validate sets, um, staying with the some of the photography stuff, I can say, OK, so the valid here's a parameter called where, and I've got my validate set for it. And now, when I say, go and find me something in my Adobe Lightroom database, where, and it actually gives me a pull down. This is obviously in the ISE, but it, this would give me the same thing through tab completion. It will give me the list of things to fill in. So here, I'm leading the user by the hand to give me good, good input. Right? That works. The previous one doesn't. The previous one just goes, oh my god, I've got a lot of red ink on screen. Not going to help anybody. Um, as well as, I mentioned this article. Um, if you if you made a note of my blog, um, I changed the I double L of O'Neill to one one one. So I'm James one triple one dot WordPress dot com, and it's the topmost article at the moment. I've got some stuff on the ins and outs of um, argument completers and validate sets. Um, because you can now do some really clever things by defining your own types to be the labels that you put in front of a parameter. Okay, that's the that's the short version. Um, I would say that as the author of something, if you can predict the values that the user's going to put should be putting in, you should be making tab fill those values in for the user. Okay, we're all lazy. We don't want to be typing these things indefinitely. So one of the things to do is to try and get tab completion to work. That means using validate sets where they make sense, using argument completers where they make sense. Um, argument completers, you don't have to follow what the completer says. Validate sets throw an error if you put in something that's not in the set. Um, this idea of dynamic validate sets is part of, the, part of the article. But one of the great things with that is you can say, and the example I used, is you can say, I've no idea what printers are on a system, but if I've got a command that works and it does something with a printer, I want to pull up the local printer names. And the user's got to put in one of those printer names. Right? So an argument completer will, would help fill in the right names, but it wouldn't reject bad ones. Version 6 has got this idea of a dynamic validate set that says, when I run, go get, me the, go get me the validate set that applies here and now, but don't be rechecking it with every keystroke along the command line like a completer would. And error handling. A um, number of places I used to see people changing error action preference. I, it's just one of those ones that kind of says, yeah, OK, so you, you've learned one of the ways of stopping errors occurring, but actually, this is not really what you should do. Um, error action silently continue is useful. Um, there are a few commands that don't work with that. Some of the ones in AD, um, get AD user was, was one that, that spring, springs to mind. Um, they don't actually take any notice of uh, error action preference, so you need to wrap them in, in try catch. And Normally, an empty catch is a, is a kind of bad thing to do, but again, you can allow yourself an exception if, you, if the error action doesn't work. But be careful with the throw command. Um, 
the, the, the piece below is from an old version of the, um, the Excel module that I work on. Um, and what it used to do, well, I'm gonna sh I'll show you a simplified example, but what it actually used to do is it used to make the errors that you got back no less frequent, but a lot less helpful. And so we, we, we changed that. So just to break the thing up, because this is very, very much slides and not, um, not enough demos. So what I'm going to do is just drop out of here, get rid of that horrible picture, and here we've got, for simplicity, we've got the ISE. So here I've got a function, simple function called test, and if I run test, it outputs some output. Well, not real output. As you can see, oh, that's useful. I'll try that again. So when I run it, you can see it just goes, OK, here's three stages. Is that OK for size, by the way? Yeah. So in case you didn't know this, by the way, the, you know mo many commands take a, a minus verbose switch. Write verbose also takes the verbose switch. So it basically says, ignore the person's verbose preference. So if I go write verbose, boo, nothing happens. If I go write verbose, boo, minus verbose, it <laughs> overrides the preference. So instead of doing write host in here, because these are, are verbose messages, well, I, I'll just do that. So you can see here, my function takes a parameter called go wrong. If go wrong is specified, we throw a failure message and we actually spit something out that says, oh, something went wrong. Something went wrong. Okay. Now, if we don't do that and go wrong is specified, something worse happens. Okay. So let's run this test. In fact, I've got it there, but I'll just do it from here. So test minus go wrong. Something bad. Ha so we started. Something bad happened. We threw an error message. That's great. Okay, so my typical user comes along and says, oh, I don't like the red ink on the screen. So I'm going to run it like this. And you think, hang on a minute. I threw an error. Why, why did that continue? Right? Well, when you say error action silently continue, silently continue. It continued silently. It did what you asked it to, okay? So, when you write a throw statement, and the, the, number of, uh, the number of people I see just write throws like this is almost everybody. And everybody says when they see me do return here, what are you putting return in for? You've just thrown. So I then have to do this little demonstration. Okay, so that's part one. Um, while we're on the subject of... of throwing errors. Here's another test, so we'll call this test two, and this just says re remove the item and we got to here. Okay, that, that's fine, that looks good. So we'll go and delete a non-existent file, and you can see um, we got the error and we got there. And if we do error action silently continue, well, this is what, as a user, we'd expect to happen. Okay. We can say, we got there, and um, we, we were able to carry on despite the error. Now, sometimes, we don't want that to happen. So if you just look at the distinction between these two, if you look at line four here as I switch, the only thing I've done is I've added error action stop. So if I do the same thing again, so I just load my function up, and run test, this time it doesn't get to the right verbose. Okay? It's now thrown a non-terminating error. Sorry, it's thrown a terminating error. Previously it was a non-terminating error. So I've made that a terminating error. And even if I tell the function silently continue, it's still 
a terminating error. Okay? So now I've got a way of making sure the user doesn't run my function in a way that causes it to plow onto something that shouldn't run if I've got a failure. One last one just on this problem of um, trapping errors. So here I've got a function, and it basically takes a value and does some sums and generates some output. And this is deliberately intended to be not desperately readable. Whoops. Let's just run that bit. And then if I pick a random number between 1 and 5 and send it to that function, that looks OK. Return, returns, uh, returns a valid out output. So that, that looks like it works. Let's just try doing that 10 times. Oh, well, it, it works most of the time. Well, my, I, I'm happy with my... I'm, I'm like most developers. Mo, mo, most of the time's good enough for me. 99% will do. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put some error trapping in. So I'm just going to wrap that in a try and a catch that says calculation has failed. Now, do you notice here, it actually says, I tried to divide by zero... And if I'm really lucky, in fact, I have, look, this one tells me I've got a divide by zero error at line 10, and that one tells me I've got a divide by zero error at line 7. So here, line 7, 100 divided by value, will have allowed zero to be an input, but also I've subtracted something from the input, so I've done value minus 2, and then I divide by that. So... 2 is also going to give me an error. Now, I could try and unravel this because I've got the, got the code here, but I'm just going to hide this, and now, when I run this, so this is going to redefine that test 4. If I run that again, I'll just run the multiple version, what I get is just calculation fail. Now, a couple of things have happened here. The first is, it's actually failed on the first one, so the rest of my data's got lost. All right? Now, that might not be what I want to have happen. Sometimes, when you get an error, you want to try and do what you can to try and save the data, because what's coming in here might have been expensive to gather. All right? So, it's failed. But it's also said, look, calculation failed, and what's the error message? Oh, it's happened at the line throw calculation failed. So now I've got no idea where the calculation failed and what I might have done wrong. So I'm completely in the dark about what that problem was. But again, this is something you see quite a lot of. Don't use try around a really big block of code is the moral of that. What you're trying to do is you're trying to catch a fairly simple error and report it and handle it. If it's around a big block of code, you can kind of make the error go away, but you, you might not be doing the user much of a service. Now, I've mentioned this a couple of times, so I don't, don't want to dwell on this, but the biggest need, when I go into, into organisations, and I've, I've been in quite, quite a few organisations over the last two and a half, three years. Um, the biggest need I find to rewrite other people's scripts is they're obsessed with what they print to the screen. Okay. Um, particularly the use of write host, because um, write host seems to just attract people because it's colours. And I can't get over the number of people who want their output to be in pretty colours. Just, just don't go there. I also meet people who the first line they put in a script is CLS because I think that's probably what they wrote in batch files and various other things. I've got about a 1,000 lines of back scroll buffer that you've just thrown away. Don't put CLS at the top of your script. It's really naughty. And people who do their conversions, so they put format table in the, in the, in the command, or they convert something to a string, at the very least, give me a minus raw switch so that I can get the raw output out. Um, and quite often, if you've got a whole bunch of things, it's really easy to expose properties so you give back a hash table or a, or, or a custom object. Other quick tricks, by the way, 
if something deals with files, then you can fiddle the output on it so that it has a path property. Now, anything that takes input that might be a file will look for a path property and go, hey, that's got a path property. It's probably a file. So sometimes when you're doing your, your output, if you write something like this, so this again is that example where I'm querying the, the database in Lightroom, I can make sure that when I output that object, the, whatever Adobe has written in the database, I output something that looks like C backslash users MCP pictures backslash name of directory backslash name of file. And if I pipe that into copy and a destination, it will treat that database output as though I'd done a, done a directory and got a bunch of files. So that trick is really helpful. So is um, specifying some format information so PowerShell will output it. You can either write form, some formatting XML. People get a bit nervous about writing format XML. But also, you can just give a property that says, these are the preferred display properties. And if you say, these are the preferred display properties, PowerShell goes, ah, so you've got 15 properties, and these four are the ones you want to display. I'll display you a nice table with just those four properties on. And if you can specify an output type, you can't always do that. But if you can, that helps IntelliSense when you say, OK, I'm going to pipe this into another command. That command knows what properties it's going to get. A lot of the things around new use cases are thinking about what might be piped into me. So what parameter is the target for this command? What am I actually acting on as opposed to how am I doing the work? And what might I send output to? So if I'm what I was just talking about, making sure if it relates to files, it's got a path to property. And a lot of things around going from something that was written to do one job to something that's much more flexible is just a question of saying, all these things that I've set as variables somewhere in my code, they're really parameters. I'm just using them as a fixed parameter. So why don't I just shuffle them up to the top of the code, put them between a set of brackets and put param in front of them, and now they're the default values for a bunch of parameters that I can change when I run this from the command line. Now, I mentioned this before. Okay. Nobody wants, you might be enormously proud of your code, but trust me, nobody wants to read it. Well, very, very few people want to read it. Occasionally, somebody wants to take the idea and go, how did you do that? Generally, they want to use it. As I said before, if you make me read your code, I'm going to hate you afterwards. The only times we want to look in the code is if we're repairing it or we're trying to adapt it. And when we do that, we need some good signposts inside the code. Okay. And remember what I said before. It's an investment. Put a little in the jar every day. Okay, don't con yourself, you're going to write this at the end. So, how to make your code nice to work on? When you do things like write verbose, or you do write progress, you're telling the user something that's optional, but it's a great signpost for someone who's reading down your code, because it says, ah, oh, this is the bit that does the so-and-so, because he's telling the user. Okay. Blocks like region, hash region and end region do the same thing. You don't necessarily have to write comments per se. Some of these things are great signposts, and I, I call them sometimes pseudo comments. Um, sometimes it makes a lot of sense to define an alias, particularly for a parameter, and then what you use inside the, the code can be a meaningful name. So just as an example, I was talking about printers before. So I call the parameter printer name. Now the user is quite able to shorten that to printer. In fact, they can just shorten it to P. But if I define an alias for that parameter of name, if the user feels happier using name as the name of the printer, that's a great way. So they can basically say, set default printer minus name uh, Epson. Okay? And it'll, it'll do the job. If I have a, something just called name in the body of my function, what's it the name of? 
right? Name's one of those really bad variable names, okay? So don't, you know, some of the names like stuff and data and things like that, um, don't, don't have vari variables called name. But define an alias so the user can use that, not what you're using inside your code. And don't get het up on layout too much. Um, there isn't one true style, okay? Um, one good test is when I roll it up, particularly in Visual Studio Code, but also in the ISE, um, does, it read, does it read well collapsed? Okay. Um, I notice that people who come from the C world like to put braces on their own lines, and that tends to string stuff out. That's great if, you, if you're looking at fanfold paper, uh, as we used to do when we used to look at our listings. When you're looking at a landscape monitor, actually maybe squishing things up a bit is, is helpful. But different people have different preferences. There are a few things, though. Um, I noticed Christoph's in here, so I'm gonna, there's a shout out on here. Use the PS script analyzer. as a good, good habit to get into. First off, there's a style guide. I don't know if any of you know about the style guide, but there is a style guide on GitHub. You can just search for uh, PowerShell style guide and it'll give you a link to that. Um, that will tell you about general good practice. Um, Christoph's um, work on script analyzer, as I say, it's well worth, well worth a shout out. I don't know, I, I didn't, didn't make a note of what session you're delivering, Christoph, but it, his sessions are always good. He's on after me in one of the other rooms, so go, go and watch his session. But the script analyzer basically is an automated linting tool that will spot um, the kind of things that you should not be doing. Um, and it, it's a way of uh, getting into, um, into good habits. Um, it, like all automated tools, it's not infallible. There are some syntactic things that are perfectly valid to do that, that fall foul of its rules, but um, it scores a pretty high success rate and relatively few false positives, so definitely use it. And if you're not using source control, well, you should be, because you've got change history and backup and sharing in one place. Never mind, the, never mind anything else, just, you know, th those things are all good, so start using source control if you're not already. Questions about, do I combine all my files into one big one or split them into lots of small ones? Do I compile them? Uh, do I sign them? All those depend on, your, on the environment you're working in. Now, I'm not going to go into lots of matters of style. I've got this slide here, um, which, as you can see, is far too small to read, but that's included as a sort of completeness thing. Somebody asked me to write a, a sort of style guide document for their internal consumption, and this was basically the, the, the stuff that came out, out of that, and that was on top of saying, read the style guide that's on, on GitHub. Uh, so that's there as a, um, as, a, as a tip. Now, consistency. Being consistent, following a style, and, and um, following the rules of the analyzer is all good. You can be obsessive about consistency, um, but there are some, some useful guidelines. Try not to do the same thing many different ways. Um, there was a script published, a um, really useful script I saw that um, was tweeted by several people this week. And the first thing that, I, that, that went through my head when I looked at this script is, why are half the variable names in all caps and half of the variable names not in all caps? What does all caps signify? And it basically signifies that the person using it had got a sticky caps lock key. There's, there's, no, the, there's no pattern to it. But my brain is going, what, what's he done here? Why, why is this different from that? Okay. So try and do the same thing every, every way. And sometimes the familiar way is a lot better than the clever way. Okay. There's a great quote here from, uh, I was going to say Dennis Ritchie. You, know, you can see I've, I've obviously merged the, um, the C programming language authors together. It's from Brian Kernighan. Um, but debugging is harder than scripting. Right? If, you script, if you write the code the cleverest way you can, you won't be able to debug it. Okay? And I've, I've got some examples. Um, I, I said I, I collect these. Um, one place, I actually found these in two scripts. I can't remember, well, 
two different scripts, three examples from the same author. And you look at this, and he's done get content, use the, use the alias, so I have to think, what's GC do? Get content of that. Another one, he's used uh, the, the braced notation for a variable. And the third one, he's actually put get content inside a string. Right? For heaven's sake, just write env colon system drive. All of those work the same way. Um, I saw this. And you think, what? So he's setting the name, whatever this name was, to be the value of variable plus one. So he's adding one to that variable in that. Oh, right. You mean in the script, add one to the variable. Right? The, these are the kinds of things that people, people do. And you think, why did you do it that way? And a recent client, very recent client, um, again, I, I, do, I do tangents a bit, as you might have picked up. Um, my elderly mother gets frustrated because she, she f seems to have lost certain words out of her vocabulary. And she'll say, oh, I went to the place. And you're going, where on earth do you mean? And there, there is a, um, a condition that people who have, who've had strokes get where, they, where this happens. And um, my sister's a bit worried that my, my mum's actually had an undiagnosed stroke because of this. Um, well, this person appears to have had a similar condition of afflicting for PowerShell. He's lost the use of the word if. Right? So he writes all his if statements, and I, and I had like hundreds of lines of code of, of his. The word if did not appear anywhere. Every if he had was written as a switch statement. Every switch statement, even though they didn't overlap, had break or continue in. And he alternated between break and continue. Okay? Now, if you don't know the difference between break and continue in a switch statement, and where, when you don't even need them, there's probably a, some reading to do, and there's an article on my blog about that one. Um, but he could have just written that as an if. And it's not wrong. The code works. He's able to turn out code. And some of the, some of the business logic that he'd embedded in his scripts was absolute genius. These were really, really good scripts that he'd written. But he just had these strange quirks of how he coded things. And just a couple more. Um, I belong to the, the, the we don't need no stinking variables school of programming. So I like to write great long screeds of, of code where that's one command line. Okay. Sometimes this is not the most readable way. Just breaking it into um, three lines. I said don't call variables things like stuff. Okay. Don't call your functions get thing one and thing two, not unless you're into Dr. Zeus. Um, yeah, you can spot some of the parents in the audience going, oh, yes, that's at the beginning of the cat in the hat, isn't it? Um, but just breaking that into three separate lines makes it easier to read. Um, what's this last one? Uh, Oh, yes. Um, one of my um, guy that I work with a lot, Doug Fink, um, had this in a piece of his code. And you look at that and you go, that's an error. He's said if x equals the result of get something, and he meant if x is equal to, and he's written equals instead. So he's assigned the value of x to be get something. Okay. Well, he has. And he's done it on purpose. If get something returned a value, x equals get something is actually has a value. So if that was successful, that evaluates true. If that operation's unsuccessful, then it's false. Okay? And I have to spend two minutes looking at that each time, unpicking that, when you could just write it as two lines. So do the assignment, then do the if separately. OK. And yeah, remember the thing on names. Um, good variable names. Don't use things like stuff 
And if you've got get thing one and get thing two, it suggests that they're very closely coupled. Either they're two halves of the same job, or they're the same thing with different parameters. And I think I've mentioned stuff in data. Uh, just a quick tip here. Um, I use um, lowercase names to mean something's a local variable. And if it's capitalized, it's a parameter or it's a global or environment variable. So right to be understood is really the, the moral of this. Laying out your code, comments and things like the, the right verbose, right progress, regions, all help. Aliases generally make things harder because we have to stop and think, what's that an alias for? And making the parameters ex explicit and just moving them up into the parameter block is all good. So the moral on that is don't, don't think you're doing something benevolent for a total stranger. Okay? Imagine yourself a few months from now, everything's on fire, everyone's blaming you, you want to go home, make future you grateful to current day you. Other people say, imagine the next person to look at this code is an axe-wheeling psychopath. Maybe, that's, maybe that is you in a few months, who knows? So what are the, the signs that we've written something good? Is it clear about what it does? Does it work like the other things that we're used to using? Is it PowerShelly? Does it work as a composable command? Does it help the user? And can we understand it quickly when we have to look inside? I've just about used up all my questions time. Gail was signaling at me. I think he was saying I had two minutes, but the two fingers might have meant something else. Um, there are my contact details. I'm going to be around during the day if you've got any questions rather than doing form questions now. So I'm going to leave it there and let you, because I'm aware I'm standing between you and coffee. So enjoy your coffee. Have a great rest of the session. <laughs>